Hello, everybody. Welcome to this webinar from Internews Earth Journalism Network. We're very pleased you could join us today for what promises to be a very interesting talk on climate and environmental justice, a very timely topic. Uh, uh, we're also very pleased to have a distinguished group of panelists able to, to speak with you today and to answer your questions. Um, I'm going to introduce them in a moment. First, just a brief word about uh, the Earth Journalism Network. We are a global community of over 12,000 journalists from more than 180 countries. We're dedicated to covering climate and environmental issues. Uh, we're also a project of internews. We carry out a lot of activities around the world. And we def if you're not familiar with us, please do check out our website at uh, www.earthjournalism.net. If you're a working journalist, you're more than welcome to sign up and become a member. Membership is free. And uh, we definitely welcome your participation and your questions. So as I mentioned today, we're gonna be talking about climate and environmental justice. Uh, the recent Black Lives Matter protests here in the United States, combined with the unequal impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and other recent events has certainly put a spotlight on how the worst impacts of climate and environmental change almost always seems to fall on the poorest and most marginalized communities. Here in the US and, and in many other countries, that usually means that communities of color bear the brunt of the damage. So today we, uh, we have a great group of panelists here who are gonna help us explore this topic more deeply. Uh, uh, joining us today is Lisa Garcia, who is uh, previously a senior advisor to the US Environmental Protection Agency and chief advocate for environmental justice from the state of New York. She's now the head of The Fix, which is the solutions lab for Grist Magazine. It's a great online publication. If you haven't had a chance, please do check, us, check that out. Also today, we have Drew Costley, a staff writer and multimedia journalist at One Zero, which is an imprint of uh, Medium, medium.com. He's been doing some a wonderful series of stories on climate and environmental justice, and will have a lot of thoughts to share, I'm sure. And finally, we have Sweta Daga, a freelance reporter based out of Bangalore in India. Uh, she produces a lot of stories on gender and environmental justice issues. She's written about land and human rights, marginalized communities, and most recently, the impact of COVID-19 on migrant populations in and around Bangalore. So I'm going to turn it over to them in a moment, but just a uh, reminder that we really encourage you to submit your questions. Uh, to do so, uh, please look at the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, at the bottom of the Zoom platform. You'll see a little button there that says Q&A. You click on that, and that is where you should please enter your questions. And you'll see other questions listed there as well as time goes by. Uh, we, don't, we don't encourage you to put questions in the chat feature. That's a separate feature. So please do put them in the Q&A feature, and we'll We'll go through them, uh, we'll, we'll curate them and, and present them to the panelists. We're expecting this webinar to last about one hour. Uh, the first 15 minutes or so, we're gonna turn it over to the panelists so they can have some, speak some opening thoughts. And so without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa to kick us off and please Lisa, take it away. Great, thank you so much. Good morning uh, or evening, everyone. Thank you to Earth Journalism Network for inviting me, James and Sarah, thank you, um, and to the whole team, and to Drew and to Sweta for, um, I'm excited to be joining this panel. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Lisa Garcia, and I'm the director of FIX, um, the Climate Solutions Lab at GRIST. And GRIST is an online non-for-profit environmental news organization that's been around for about 20 years. Um, so the, the work at GRIST has been focusing on environmental news for many, many years. Um, I joined GRIST about six months ago to head up this new program called FIX, where we highlight the work of emerging leaders um, focusing on climate and on justice in the United States. So it's an exciting time to kind of build out this program of FIX. 
Um, you know, one theme is obviously the climate justice leaders we honor are, are making changes locally um, at, within their own communities. And sometimes the local work is obviously the most important. We're also starting a new series called Gasping for Air. So stay tuned for some of those features really highlighting the topics um, most recently around race and climate um, and, 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 and anti-racism issues. So in preparing for today, I was, um, I was thinking that one of the most distinguishing features, I think, of the environmental justice movement in the United States is it is environmental, but the EJ and indigenous and community groups has, have always led with public health, improving our environment to improve health. The community groups leading the EJ and climate justice work understand that environmental injustices are at the root of massive health disparities in communities of color and in low income communities. So I've been extraordinarily lucky to have made a career by being an advocate and working with environmental justice groups and climate justice groups on these issues. Um, and as James mentioned, I've been, I've worked with communities, a policy advisor in both federal and state government. Um, and like I said, this theme across the environmental justice movement is really working hard to try to get rid of or minimize pollution and the toxins in water, soil and products because it's impacting their community's health. Um, they've always focused on solutions also um, like transitioning to cleaner and more sustainable energy, toxic free consumer products, zero waste, zero emissions, cleaner mass or public transit systems, um, essentially pushing for a better quality of life that includes quality of healthcare, access to healthcare and good jobs. So for me, the environmental justice movement and climate justice movements more recently really are holistic and really, once again, focus on public health, even though it stems from this environmental perspective. Um, in 2009, I had the wonderful opportunity to join the Obama administration. And I recall being so excited um, to bring in the voices of the, the leaders in the EJ and climate movement to help bring about change and to try to get environmental policies and laws to focus on reducing pollution in communities and reducing health disparity. What was emerging at the time was this essence that your zip code or where you live should not determine your health outcome. It seemed simple enough, but it was such a win for the community groups to get the government to really stay and work on health disparities, to recognize what EJ groups had been saying all along, that communities of color are more likely to be overburdened by pollution and thus suffering the resulting consequences, the health disparities, higher rates of asthma, cardiac illnesses, respiratory illnesses, and certain cancers. And one distinguishing factor I think that's really important to bring up also is that race was one of the biggest factors when looking at areas of high pollution and the resulting health disparities, more so than income. For instance, we know 68% of black people live within 30 miles of a coal-fired power plant. Farm workers who are 80% Latino are more likely to have health impacts or stressors from exposure to toxic pesticides. Um, and studies have shown that African-American and Puerto Ricans are three times more likely to die from asthma attacks than whites. At the time, the federal government started to act and we put in place a few efforts to reduce the health disparities and social determinants of health. Um, of course, that all changed in 2016. Um, and the administration has different priorities. But the fact is health disparities, especially when it comes to communities of color, are, of color are not going away. So fast forward to today. Um, you know, the reality in the United States, a study um, issued in April by the Harvard School of Public Health, finding that in studying over 3,000 counties, zip codes, once again, probably, they found that people who live in regions with higher levels of air pollution are more likely to die from the disease, the coronavirus, than people who live in less polluted areas. And then just recently, um, on July 5th, actually, in a New York Times article, 
um, it was reported that Black and Latino people in the United States were three times as likely to contract the coronavirus than their white neighbors, and they were two times as likely to die from the virus um, than their white neighbors. And so the numbers are still coming in, but once again, it's terrible news. We see what's happening. Um, the studies show that where you live, your zip code is a predictor for bad health and mortality. The story, unfortunately, tracks very well with the climate justice movement and the environmental movement, what they've been saying all along. We need to stop polluting the air and dumping in communities of color because they can't breathe. Literally, they're dying from it. So while this is tragic news, especially given the administration, uh, you know, some people have heard that even some people in the administration didn't believe the coronavirus was that bad, that it was a hoax. Um, and even this administration is reducing or rolling back environmental protections, waiving enforcement actions. Um, and so you, you just see the, the um, unfortunately, the poor response from the federal government. So as we think about these issues today of race and equity and environment, or as we discuss them and try to think of what happened and what we could do, I have a few thoughts. One is the environmental justice movement has always had this notion of historic racism and white supremacy that has played a big part um, in building up the systems of making decisions and in the built environment. So this moment of anti-racism is kind of great to see and the new kind of um, energy around it because I think there's listening more and maybe even allies that will come into this movement and really fight um, for what climate justice advocates have been saying is reduce pollution, really tackle racism, and get to a just transition, reduce those climate impacts, ban toxics and pesticides, and improve quality of life. Um, anyway, I, I really hope that's what will come of it. The other thing I just wanted to mention is sometimes it seems like overwhelming and that there's a lot going on and there's so much to tackle. One of the things I have learned from the environmental justice and climate justice movement is that they, it's such a resilient movement. I mean, it's an intergenerational movement. The EJ and indigenous leaders that I have worked with stand on the shoulders of their elders and share and tell stories of ancestors and civil rights activists icons that have hearkened such momentum and give people strength that can, you cannot dampen the movement. It is those EJ and indigenous leaders um, and the civil rights icons and the young people bringing up that are coming up in this movement that have always stood again and again to fight for what's right. Um, so I, I, what I'm trying to say is I feel like there's hope in, in this um, kind of in all the ill that we're seeing. I'll just close quickly with this. The words, I can't breathe, um, coming from the George Floyd um, uh, terrible death at the hands of the police, ignited the United States. Um, and hopefully we'll see the change come from this movement. A friend of mine recently wrote in Energy and News at the Hill, hopefully part of the change will be a more breathable air, more breathable air and better respiratory health for the black and brown communities who have been victims of systemic racism in our environmental management systems. I personally really do feel like there's hope. People are listening, like I said, people are coming together. And also, if you think about it, Congress for the first time passed legislation that recognizes communities of color are more at risk from the effects of climate change. So I'm hopeful that maybe one day we'll get to a place where you live or your zip code will just be that. It's where you live, it's just a number. It won't be a determinant of early health. It's just a random number. And so that's my help. And my hope that this continues to be an issue that everyone's focusing on and talking, um, talking about. So thanks again for inviting me and allowing me to speak. I'll pass it back to James. Thank you, Lisa. Drew, I'm going to turn it right over to you. Please take it away. Sure. Um, thanks, James. Thanks to uh, the Earth Journalism Network. Um, really happy to be here this, um, this morning. You might see me sip some coffee because it's, I'm actually in D.C., but it is still 9 a.m. 
Um, so um, if, if you do, I apologize in advance. Uh, yeah, I am, as, as James was saying, I'm staff writer for One Zero. It's a publication that was started by the, um, the self-publishing platform Medium. They got into um, creating in-house publications last year and they started a science and technology publication called One Zero. I cover environmental and climate justice and also write a, write a bit about um, health technology, environmental technology, and just science, like the, the enterprise of science in general um, for them. Uh, and, weekly, and then I write a weekly column called The Color of Climate and uh, about sort of the more newsier uh, week to week uh, developments in the environmental justice or climate justice um, field and I write a series called Black in the Time of Climate Change which focuses on how black folks in the U.S. are dealing with not, not only climate change but other forms of environmental degradation um, and those are sort of longer feature stories, uh, deeper dives and um, yeah I think just to, just to build off of what Lisa was saying is this moment in the U.S., even before the Black Lives Matter protests with the coronavirus, was bringing to bear um, a lot of what people in the environmental justice movement have been saying for, for decades now. And really, actually, there's a narrative about the environmental justice movement that it was, that, and, it, and it started in earnest in the 80s. But I think if you go back, you can find examples of indigenous folks, of, of black folks in the US, of Latinx folks, um, grappling, with, grappling with questions of justice when it comes to the environment specifically, maybe not climate change, as that's the development of, of, of you know, the last, you know, a realization of ours over the last half century. But um, even if you think about one of, one of, the, one of the biggest topics of, of sort of, the um, of the environmental movement is land use. Um, who gets access to the land? And that is a essential question to the the, st the story and history of the U.S. Um, you know, with you have colonizers who came from Europe and took the land from the indigenous folks um, over you know the course of centuries um, and relegated them to to reservations. Um, and, and so, and so I think, um, you know, environmental justice has always been, has always been, um, it's, it's a term that we, we have now to describe things that have been happening for centuries, really. Um, and so I, and I think, you know, you have these, these flashpoints, you have these moments like the coronavirus or like Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, you have Hurricane Harvey in, in Houston that really highlight the things that Lisa's talking about that activists are working on, on a sort of like day-to-day -day basis. They're trying to make, you know, they're trying to, it's two, sort of two things, right? It's, it's they're trying to make day-to-day -day life in these communities better and, and, and improve the health impacts um, and health outcomes. But also they're trying to make the communities more resilient for these moments that are almost inevitable now that climate change is creating all of these weather events like cyclones or hurricanes if you're in the U.S. and wildfires, historic wildfires. Um, you saw that in, even if you, if you look at the, the historic wildfires in, um, in, in, in Australia um, earlier this year, it almost seems, it seems like that was a decade ago now. <laughs> but that happened this year. Um, you see that there were people, you know, some of the more affluent folks in Australia were able to just shelter into the, in their homes as long as the wildfire wasn't going to cross through their neighborhoods. And you saw a lot of um, indigenous folks, Aboriginal folks in Australia that, you know, were forced out of their, out of their homes um, because of things that were caused by climate change, which is ultimately, it's essentially in, in, in just a story. Climate change, you know, the, the effects of climate change um, were created by, by, the, by, in, by industry, by fossil fuels, by, um, in a way, by imperialism, by these, these forces that have um, sort of drained the earth 
or poisoned it with these new technologies without any real foresight into how they would impact, you know, the long-term impacts. And now we're dealing with it, right? Um, and so, and so, yeah. So I think what I'm what I'm really interested in is before this moment started, um, is is really covering um, environmental justice issues as a beat, as a day-to-day -day basis. You know. Um, what are these communities doing? How can they, how how can they be connected with resources? How can they connect with each other um, and build coalitions? I think, um, and, and then honestly, some of the most innovative ideas for how we get out of the how we get out of or deal with the climate crisis are happening in these communities. They're frontline communities. They're the first communities that are being impacted by by climate change. Um, they are the communities that have been hardest hit by the environmental movement. Um, I think one thing, one, one really quick, I'll give two examples. Um, one, one example from on, on the climate change front is you see sort of the, the, um, the growth of, of, of sort of like community resiliency in the wake of, of Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. You have the, the creation of community gardens um, throughout the Gulf Coast because um, there were people in the U.S. who were on like food assistance, like supplemental assistance, um, who were, who ran out of their their supplemental assistance by the end of the month when Hurricane Katrina hit, and they were in, unable to get food to even prepare for the storm. And so you had the rise of community gardens in some of these in some of these cities in order to make sure that the most the, you know that poor folks that poor like poor communities of color have access to food at all times um especially to prepare for for major weather events like hurricane katrina and then on the climate front um oh sorry and then on the environmental front you see the rise now of um in terms of like uh, monitoring air quality you see the rise of sort of um these these private air monitoring devices that are are, are sort of that are placed on on private homes or in libraries, um, and they're used to monitor air quality more accurately in communities um, across the world. Well, these are sort of these air monitoring devices, and in, 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 in the fight to get more accurate air air quality data is something that's been happening in communities of color that have poor air pollution for decades now. Um, they, they, because they'll, they'll be like one air monitor in a community that is, let's say, you know, it'll be one air monitor for a community of, of, of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. Um, and it is, um, and it's, and, it, and it's sort of taken to, to represent that whole community when, you know, you might have, and it's also actually sort of strategically placed away from air pollution in some in some cases if you look at the case of in, in of, of detroit um they they place air the 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 like the the state or the local government or corporations that are tasked with monitoring air quality will put it will put air quality monitors away from where pollution is actually happening to, and then to say that pollution actually isn't as high as residents say or reporting it is anecdotally so they fight for or they buy their own air quality monitors and they place them in places where they know there's air pollution to prove that there's air pollution. So, so the and they, they've been and they've been and these communities have been working on this for decades. So these sort of like you know innovative solutions um, that people are just coming up with out of survival, honestly, um, is 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 really sort of compelling for for me as as a journalist to, um, to follow. Um, and then, you know, I, I come into this as, um, I come into to my work as a journalist, as, as a black man who um, is descended of slaves. Um, and, and, and as Lisa said, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a relatively young person, I'm getting older, but I, you know, I, I, was, I, was, I was raised by my community to, to serve it. And so, and to serve other communities like mine. Um, and so, so that's that's sort of where where the motivation comes from the work that I do, um, and um, and yeah, it's a it's it's a, it's quite a time. I would just say it's quite a time, um, the, you know, um, to to 
there's great innovation, there's great loss happening, um, and there's a great urgency for people to act and for, to, for people to stay focused, honestly. Um, in the U.S., a lot of people are losing focus around the coronavirus. Um, and, 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 and the government is still, still has not lifted its non-compliance waivers, um, even though the coronavirus continues. Um, and so, um, or, or that, or even though they're, re they're reopening parts of the government, but they have not reopened EPA uh, monitoring of, of, of environmental degradation. So, um, so yeah, so it's, it's a great time and um, I feel really fortunate um, to be able to do the work that I do and talk to the people I talk to and be in the communities I'm in. And uh, yeah, I'll just pass it back to James. Thank you, Drew. Thank you so much. Sueta, we're going to turn it over to you now. Perhaps you could give us a global perspective on this. Huh. Thank you, James. Thanks to Earth Journalism Network and everybody on the team for inviting me and to Lisa and Drew. Don't know about a whole global perspective, but I'll, I'll do my best to talk about India. Globe. <laughs> um, so, hi everyone. My name is Shweta Daga. I'm a freelance journalist based in Bangalore. Um, I cover, uh, like James said, environmental and gender justice issues. My work has taken me all over India, from the mountains of Kashmir and Ladakh to the islands of Lakshadweep. Um, I write about forests, farms, and fisheries. Um, but my real focus has always been about the communities that have been impacted because of the existing inequitable systems that sort of exacerbate changing environments. So I've written about um, indigenous communities in Arunachal Pradesh, which is the northeast of India. I've written about forest dwelling in tribal communities in Rajasthan and Uttar Pradesh. And in Tamil Nadu, there was a fishing community that was fighting off uh, a huge nuclear power plant. Unfortunately, according to the Environmental Performance Index, India ranks about 168 out of 180 countries. And uh, while black and brown people have always been the most vulnerable in the West, here in India, we call it the caste system uh, that ranks people by birth uh, and has traditionally marginalized and disenfranchised what we now call as Dalit communities but also Muslim communities and tribal and indigenous communities. So um, we basically see these traditional class, caste, gender um, inequalities played out now through lack of access to basic needs like healthcare and of course economic inequalities, uh, which have been further sharpened during COVID. I mean, basically millions of people's livelihoods have been smashed. Uh, what's interesting is a lot of the migrants who uh, had come to urban areas, um, I consider them environmental migrants because they were coming uh, for work, um, you know, where in rural areas, you know, land and water have been polluted and taken away, so they had to come to cities. Um, I'll give you a small example. Um, after years of fighting, the Forest Rights Act was implemented in India in 2006, and it was actually a huge win for forest dwelling communities. And you know, in the opening lines, it actually talked about reversing historic injustice. You know, um, because lands were grabbed during colonial times, and and actually even after independence, and that continues to happen. So in 2018, I, I actually went to Uttar Pradesh, which is our most populous state, and I wrote about four women, all from uh, tribal communities or Dalit communities, who'd gone to jail because they were using the legal framework of the FRA, the Forest Rights Act, to fight for their lands. I just also want to take a minute and acknowledge that the very custodians of our ecological hotspots um, in India are sometimes treated like the problem. And so when land reserves happen in the name of wildlife protection or national parks, we end up pushing out tribal communities who've been living with animals and nature for centuries. Um, I did a story on the wild shepherds, not wild, they were raising um, wild camels and and goats. Um, and so we're in real danger of actually erasing traditional knowledge. So um, 
I feel like India hasn't been democratic for a while. Our governance systems have systematically been dismantled from freedom of speech to um, a very biased Supreme Court and actually even transparency. The current government does not feel the need to share its plans with people and uh, it ends up destroying livelihoods um, in the name of what we call development, um, where we construct, construct huge roads or dams um, or clear flat farmlands for more IT parks. But um, right now, watching what's been happening with the Black Lives Matter movement take place, I just wanted to mention, I just draw attention to one thing. Before COVID hit at the end of 2019, for the first time in years, there was um, peaceful, powerful national protests in India against something called the Citizens Amendment Act and the National Public Register, when coupled together, uh, could be used um, to prove that Muslim citizens were illegal aliens. And I wanted to mention it on this call because we're talking about vulnerable communities that are hit hardest by environmental injustice. And it's not about comparing movements, but I feel like something of what's like what's happening um, with BLM in the US would be really difficult in India right now. We're so used to pr police brutality and violence that it's actually normalized and um, reported very little, if at all. Being a journalist or being an activist right now is very difficult. Questioning the government in India is nearly impossible. We actually have doctors and lawyers who are in jail for trying to draw attention to inequalities. So while climate change continues to do its thing, it's changed our monsoons, it's changed rainfall patterns and snowfall patterns, we are going out of our way to make man-made disasters even more certain with the mismanagement of water and, and land resources. Uh, drinking water is a huge issue in India. Uh, I mean, just in the last few months, we've had cycle Amphan hit, uh, and we're gonna see an increased amount of intensity and frequency of cyclones. Um, the government has opened up coal mines, our national coal mines to private bids. So while the rest of the world is moving away from coal, we're sort of running toward it. Um, the national fisheries policy came out in just in the last few months. And because it happened during COVID, a lot of fishing communities felt like they weren't consulted. And one of the, the biggest things is the environmental impact assessment, um, which is part of the um, the National Ministry of Environment and Forest in India has been watered down to the point where uh, essentially in Assam, the state of Assam, which is in the Northeast, there was a massive um, fire triggered by a gas well blowout um, that was adjoining a national park. And the reason that it also happened is because there were no public hearings uh, that happened before um, the drilling took place. And without the EIA in India, um, that might just get worse. I think I want to say that um, things will get better, and I and I think that there are movements like we're in in some pockets like our renewable energy is getting better, and India is is doing better in in terms of maybe climate change. But I think for me, the scariest part is that. What I see over and over again is that there are no second generation of communities that want to continue farming or continue working in forests or continue fishing. And even their parents don't want that for their children because it's so hard. And with the vanishing of these livelihoods, a lot of traditional livelihoods, I really fear um, a vanishing of a lot of traditional knowledge. So that to me, as a journalist and as a reporter, I, I feel like to me, that's one of the most important things for me to focus on. So thank you so much for having me. I'll turn it back over to Jeans. I hope it made thank, sense. Thank you, Shweta. That was a very nice summary of what's going on in India. It sounds like in both India and the US, we're seeing kind of rollbacks of environmental regulations, uh, non-compliance, and it's kind of scary in this era of COVID. I, uh, we're starting to get questions coming in. Thank you, everyone. Please keep the questions coming in to the Q&A section. Uh, we're going to be 
presenting them to the to the panelists. Um, one of the first questions we have is it kind of refers to the parallels between climate change and COVID-19. It's been it's almost as if I, I think people have remarked on this. It's almost a, as if COVID-19 is kind of a sped up version of climate change. We're seeing again we're seeing marginalized communities be, being most vulnerable. Uh, suffering the most impacts. Uh, but we're also seeing that uh, a lot of people aren't really able to, to shelter themselves. Some people uh, are, are desperate for work and they have to go to work and that leaves them more vulnerable to the impacts of COVID-19 and we can, that could be a problem with climate change as well. And then we're also seeing as one of our, our audience members noted is that so there are some people in the middle class, uh, both in the U.S. and and I guess other places too, that uh, are kind of ignoring, uh, uh, ignoring COVID nineteen. Maybe they're skeptics, uh, or or whatever, and uh, are carrying on business as usual, and that's kind of threatening everybody. And that's kind of a similar situation we see with climate change, where, you know, the skeptics don't want to don't want to address the, the issue and, and try to ignore it. So are there lessons we can learn from COVID-19 to try and build a better response to climate change? And, and also, do you think COVID-19 is, is taking away from coverage, from journalistic coverage or, or other, other, uh, other attention to climate change? Or is it, is it helping people to see how climate change could also have similar devastating impacts. Um, I'm happy to, I, I, I think I'd like each of you to address it perhaps briefly because we do have other questions coming in, but uh, I can turn it over. It, does anyone want to answer first? Yeah, I can. Um, yeah, so I, I agree with the, you know, a lot of what you're saying. I, yeah, I covered a story about this um, actually like now it's like a month and a half or two months ago um and and i talked to climate climate activists some academics who study climate um and they see they see, yeah it's this this seems like a very sort of like a, they say this is like a microcosm of, of of what's been happening with the climate crisis so far and in the other forms of, of environmental pollution and degradation as well um in that and also, as this has developed, at least in the U.S. and in some of the other countries like Russia, Israel, um, Brazil, um, that have uh, have have uh, fumbled their res in in, uh, in England, in the U.K., fumbled their response to the coronavirus. Um, you see parallels in this trade-off for industry, for um, for capitalism, to to continue um, um, at the cost of human life um, is the biggest thing that you see um, in, in, in a lack of governmental response or sort of an, um, or a lack of resolute government response. Um, there's this ambiguity. Um, I was just watching also, I was just watching the news earlier this morning and, and you had um, the governor of New Jersey saying on one end, that that they are trying to prevent deaths, but they're stopping short of um, actually closing restaurants again. Um, so you have this um, you have this this sort of uh, inability to to put really strong measures in place to to live to to almost literally stop the bleeding, and that's the exact same thing we're seeing with climate. Um, so um, and that, that's what that's what a lot of the climate justice activists. Um, and, and academics who study climate, um, who I spoke to a, month, a couple months ago, were saying about how these two, um, these two, these two situations compare. Lisa, Shweta, you want to respond? Um, the, I'll just quickly add, yeah, that there's um, there's so many parallels, as you mentioned. Um, and, um, and I think one of the things that, um, I mean, hopefully, you know, when I heard one of the, in the United States, we call them essential workers, like the grocery store workers and the healthcare workers, 
they interviewed someone and they said, we really appreciate all the thanks and people recognizing us almost for the first time that we're, we're kind of at the front line of this and, and, um, and people thanking us for showing up at our jobs, but that we don't want it to end. And so what you're, I think what you're hearing is, you know, many people are saying just because the protests end doesn't mean racism has ended. Just because maybe COVID, not in the United States, but in other places, it seems like, um, you know, they're able to tackle it. Not to forget about the people who were there and, and the essential workers who are still struggling for equity and pay, who, are in the United States, certainly um, usually people of color or people who can't afford um, or don't have access to great health care themselves or access to, um, to other resources. So I, it'd be great if we could kind of take those parallels and say, this is a big issue and it needs systemic and real investment to change. And that these, you know, these band-aids or this patchwork or thanking someone today, you have to thank them tomorrow and the next day and the next day and make sure to invest in their future, invest in their quality of life in all of us. And it's the same thing for climate change. It's gonna take all of us, it's gonna take a big investment um, for, for us to really tackle this issue. Um, and I think, and as I was saying earlier, the result is hopefully better quality of life and better health for, for, for all communities. Um, anyway, so. Um, so I think there are huge parallels and hopefully the momentum will, will stay there front and center for the real change that's needed. I think I said it uh, earlier, but for me, the COVID in India, what it basically did was it highlighted, it, it brought out of the shadows and into the light, the extreme inequality in which we're living in. Uh, so there are millions of migrant workers who come in, who travel across India and who come into larger cities in larger urban areas for work. And a lot of the reason is because they're, the lands, the farmlands or the forest lands, or you know, even if they were fishing communities that they were living in and working in have been either land grabbed or have been polluted. Water sources have been taken away from them. It's, it's almost impossible to live in those areas so they have to come into urban areas and work. And then of course there's more, um, you, you see that there's like, the, the resources are, are less in the, in the urban areas. So for me, what I, I think what's happened is that it, it basically shone a big light on the inequalities that, were, were, that are already happening in India and, and why, I think the question is, why are there so many migrants living in urban areas, you know? Mm -hmm. Thank you everyone. Um, we have a question about the connection between climate, environment, and health. And Lisa, you touched on this a lot, so maybe you, you can have a stab at this one. Uh, the question is, you know, given all these connections, and we know how much climate change also is going to have a huge impact on public health, uh, why does it seem like activists and funders and in these two fields, environment and health, they seem to Act, act in separate silos. They, 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 it is very difficult oftentimes to bridge that gap between environment and health. Yeah, I think, um, and I think I mentioned this a little bit, I tried to respond to someone. I think that the, the silos um, have been driven, I, I would say, um, by some of the more mainstream groups. Uh, like I mentioned, I feel like the environmental justice movement and Drew, Drew mm -hmm. kind of stated this, they have always been aware about the health impact from air pollution, from toxics, from lead in their water, right? That, that it, it's just been, unfortunately, the, maybe the voices that haven't been heard as much. Um, and so to the credit of, of the justice movement, now more and more people are talking about these issues and uh, working on it. And so one of the things that Certainly, like when I was in the Obama administration, I remember people were really excited because the Department of Health was actually going to include environment as a causation to look at in their Healthy People 2020. It was the first time that the Department of Health was recognizing that you could have health disparities or poor health outcomes due to your environment. 
And so that push and that understanding has slowly been, I guess, awakening certain health, um, health officials and much more of the, I would say, the historically white environmental organizations is coming to this place that not only are we trying to com conserve big swaths of land, like the Grand Canyon and, and uh, very important places, open spaces, but that we also need to protect people who are being impacted in the health. So I think more and more you'll see, um, like there's a platform that came out called the Equitable and Just National Climate Platform, big environmental groups, environmental justice groups, indigenous groups, community groups coming together and putting forth this joint platform of why you need to work on these issues of health, environment, and justice as one, because they all live together and they're all super important. And obviously, um, and I also put in the Slack or the response, building equity and alignment, almost like challenging funders and large environmental groups to say, you need to actually pay attention to what's going on with frontline communities and invest because that's where the future is, is investing in the work that they're doing and the health. So I hope that um, this happens, continues, this momentum continues, and that everyone will really see that there's no difference, that you have to work on both environmental issues and public health issues. Thank you, Lisa. So we've got questions for each of you individually. Uh, I'm gonna read them off for, for each of you so you can each respond, but you can also feel free to respond to the questions addressed to other panelists. So Drew, the question we have for you is, what is the degree of overlap between climate deniers and COVID-19 deniers? Do you see any, any, uh, any overlap there? Yeah, what? and I was, yeah, I, oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, I thought I'd just read off all the questions and then you guys can uh, feel free to respond as you see fit. Uh, Sweta, um, let's see. When doing stories about displacement due to dams, factories, or other projects, or even due to sea level rise. Uh, oh, wait, I just lost it here. The okay. my fault, sorry. No, no, it's, it's the Q&A feature, sorry. Have you ever checked out the gender and caste community identities of those who are displaced and reported on that? And for Lisa, the question we have is, uh, beyond cumulative impacts of, of legislation, what U.S. policies, either from the state or the federal government, I guess, would have the most positive impacts to ameliorate social determinants of health? So Drew, maybe I'll kick it over to you first and you, you can respond, thank you. Sure, yeah, I was sorry, I was responding to it um, in the, okay. the Q&A, but okay. um, it was actually proving to be a little bit um, difficult to type out. So um, yeah, so I was saying, yeah, generally speaking, these two groups of people at least closely overlap politically in the US, at least how they're being represented in the media. Um, they typically sort of fall on the political right. And that's, that's these are very broad generalizations. Um, and I would um, encourage whoever asked that question to, to, to look into it more. Um, but my understanding of it is that they, there is a close, there's close overlap. Um, and many of the people who deny how bad COVID-19 has been is or could be are also climate deniers. And then interestingly enough, um, uh, a, a large percentage of tweets that are sent out denying climate change um, are sent out from bots or fake accounts. Um, and a large percentage of tweets, and I think, I think it's really actually the, the majority of tweets um, when studied by, by academics who like study online um, communication or social media communication, um, uh, a large amount, a, a, a majority of tweets sent out denying COVID-19's um, um, how bad it is are, are also sent out from fake accounts and from bots. So um, that could be also shaping our, at least for those of us who are a little more online, um, um, with discourse um, shaping our perception of how these two groups overlap, but also like when you look at um, at least politically the people who are um, 
who were protesting for the for the government to reopen or for the economy to reopen and um and not wearing masks and, and things like that are also uh, some of the same people that um that are that typically are climate deniers that's that's very generally speaking i, I don't mm -hmm. i don't um yeah. yeah that as far as i know yeah there's a lot of overlap thank you drew uh shweta So I think almost every story that I've done um, in the last five years, at least, have been, uh, uh, if they've been on environmental issues, climate change, ecological issues, have all been of vulnerable communities um, because they are the ones who usually get hit the hardest the first. So it's been, yes, women. Um, like I said, the four women that I reported on uh, two years ago, they had gone to jail because they were fighting for land rights. Um, farmers, um, Dalit community, um, indigenous communities, it's, it's almost 100% vulnerable communities that are being hit in India first. Um, in urban areas, I mean, everybody's hit by water, the lack of water resources, but that's something that if you have enough money, you can buy. So I think it's not just, I mean, it's, it's the inequality is also economic. So it's coupled with um, environmental issues and actually resources more than anything else in India. We, we're facing a lot of, we just don't have enough of, or even if we do, it's so badly mismanaged. Um, there's, um, according to um, Sainath, P. Sainath, who's uh, my editor in chief, um, there was 83 million tons of surplus food during COVID yeah. in India. And yet we're still struggling to feed people. So the mismanagement of resources is also so terrible that even if, if even if we had enough for everybody, they don't they don't get it. So it's almost a hundred percent vulnerable communities that I've uh, been reporting on. Thank you, Shweta. Lisa? Um, thanks for the question. So, um, so I would say on a federal level, um, one thing that I think would work if it's complied with well and, um, and implemented is the National Environmental Policy Act, um, which, which allows for a public engagement in the beginning, which is a huge issue for for obviously environmental justice and climate justice groups to be engaged, to participate. And so, um, so I'll just quickly say that one of the successes that groups are celebrating in the United States right now is the judge um, shut down um, two pipelines. And so the Standing Rock Sioux fought um, for the DAPL, the, um, the pipeline that was going to go through and and basically um, impact their water sources, and they fought in court with NEPA to say that the the um, the permit seekers or the industry did not look at the impacts to the indigenous community there, and so it was a way for them to to stop the pipeline from going forward. Uh, until an assessment is done. So like Sweta was saying, we also have the environmental impact statement, but that this was done so incorrectly that they have to stop um, the pipeline moving forward. And the other one um, was an Atlantic coastline pipeline that was stopped once again by communities saying, you didn't look at the impacts. This is gonna have huge health impacts, environmental impacts. Um, Anyway, so I would say NEPA is definitely something one, when used, the National Environmental Policy Act, when used correctly and complied with it, that's a huge push. Um, and then you also see legislation, like in California, they just passed a mandate saying that um, by 2045, um, manufacturers can only sell electric vehicles. Um, in Portland, Oregon, there was a clean energy fund that was passed um, at, you know, once again, at the pushing of environmental justice groups. Um, in New York State, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, going to 100% carbon-free electricity by 2040. And they just, New York State just pulled together a climate advisory board with actual frontline representatives from frontline communities and community groups across the country. Um, so while I would say, you know, I would just say 30 states in the United States and Washington DC have some type of climate legislation 
that is trying to get at reducing those impacts. Um, we can go further, obviously, but, but there is a real attempt to get at some of these um, reducing the health impacts and obviously climate impacts. And a lot of them are focused on communities of color. Oh, and like I said, Congress for the first time um, passed huge climate legislation in the House. I get that the Senate, it probably won't move because of the Senate in the United States. We have the bicameral, anyway, um, cabinet, so, or parliament system, I guess. But um, so it won't pass. But the point is that it does recognize the impacts to communities of color for the first time and that cumulative impact. Thank you, Lisa. We're coming up to the end of our hour. So I want to give each of the panelists uh, uh, one last chance to speak their minds and say what, you know, maybe say, speak some closing thoughts. But also, I wonder if each of you could address um, what stories you think journalists, our, most of our audience are journalists, you know, working all around the world um, under various different circumstances, admittedly, but what stories on climate environmental justice they should be looking out for? Um, and, and again, speak you know, any final thoughts you have. And I'll just make one closing note myself because Drew, your, your comments about um, people's lack of access to air quality data to me is a very, it's an issue I've been really interested in over the years, working with air quality sensors. And I just got a story this morning, just an hour ago, say, you know, stating how half the world's population lacks access to air quality data. I'm gonna put a link to the story into the chat so anyone who's interested in this can check it out. Uh, but I'm gonna turn it now over to our panelists. Drew, maybe you'll, you'll start off with your closing thoughts, please. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think, I think in terms of, so there's no, um, yeah, so I think that the climate, at least in the US, the climate and environmental justice movement um, is very, is very community driven. So, um, and I think that there's a very strong lesson from, from that, you know, um, uh, the stories you should be covering are the ones that the people in these communities that you're covering say you should be covering. Um, they, they know. Um, I think generally speaking, you know, issues of water and food are where we're going to feel um, sort of the day-to-day -day effects of climate change um, and environmental degradation. Um, we're already feeling those effects on a day-to-day -day, um, in some of these communities, and we're going to continue to, and it's going to intensify. But I think um, as just a matter of course, um, it, it, the way that I approach my work is that, um, is that the people, especially like elders in the community, um, know they know what's going on. Um, they um, the the and everybody else is, is usually late to the party. Um, academics, activists, even are, are separate. And I'm, I want to make a point of separating out activists from like elders and people who are in the community. They know. Um, what what stories need to be covered so go and talk to them spend time with them absent of reporting any deadline st story be in the community um and and learn from them um so those are the stories um that you that you all need to be covering and then i just really quickly um yeah so i just want to address the just the the the, the last thing i want to say is addressing sarah's um question you know, why is it important to humanize these stories? Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's because that is, you know, we, we think, we feel before we think, um, you know, um, and, and we can, we've spent decades now covering climate and the environment from the perspective of people who are putting out projections and predictions about how bad it's going to be, but you notice people didn't actually start to pay attention, at least in the U.S., until Hurricane Katrina, until you start seeing images of people on the top of their roofs, um, until you start seeing, um, hearing stories of people dying um, at, the, at, at sports arenas where they're refugees in their own cities. Um, and so it's really important to humanize these stories because there's no other way that that you're going to have a sustained and la lasting impact of your work on others and, and, and get them to actually act to try to make change in their own communities and in the world. 
um, unless they unless they're able to make that sort of heart connection, the feeling connection with other people who are actually um, who are actually suffering from these these um, these issues. Thank you, Drew. Shweta. Um, I think for me, the, I, I, I feel like I've always, um, wanted to hear what different communities, um, uh, have been going through more than anything. And I think those stories, I, I want to echo Drew in some way and say that I think it, it is about the communities that are being affected. Uh, all my stories sort of reflect that. I might not have enough data or I might not have, I know a lot about the science, but I definitely know about what's going on the ground. Um, I think for me, one of the things that I, I think, I don't know if I should recommend anything, but a learning that I really have had in, in my reporting is that I, it takes time to go and, and live that life. Every story I've done, I've gone to the field. I've spent a week to 10 days with those people. I've learned what their experiences are. I've talked to them about their challenges. And um, that to me is a, is, a, is a big part of this. I, I think without really understanding what's going on, it's, a, it's really hard to write stories that make an impact or that really get out their voices. And for me, the, the whole point of doing this is to try and, and get their voices out. So I think for me, that's a, one of the biggest learnings that I've had. I don't, and I think that that hopefully will be more helpful than my recommendations. I think people know what's going on. Um, I think the only other thing that I think would be important as a learning is that the economics uh, are not far away from environmental justice issues. And especially in India, the economics are really important to understand why are we in this situation? What are the systemic um, like parameters and the laws that regulate these issues. And I think that's really important also, so. Thank you, Shweta and Lisa, if you can wrap it up for us, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Shweta and Drew. I, um, I, I agree completely that we have to um, continue to amplify the voices of the people doing the real work in communities, the frontline communities. I mean, um, and it takes time because a lot of times, as we mentioned, they're the ones working on unemployment issues, pay equity issues, healthcare issues. And so it's all, you know, once again, they, everyone sees it as a holistic um, issue to work on. It's not just climate in a bubble or environment in a bubble. Um, and so one of the most beautiful things, as everyone's saying, is to go and spend time and really um, join and learn um, and then tell the wonderful stories of people doing work, people fighting for solutions and getting solutions like, um, you know, real clean energy solutions or, or um, electric vehicles or cleaner buses stories. Anyway, so there's just so much out there that we can continue to amplify. Um, and, and it does take time, but, but in the end, you're telling the stories, the real success stories. Um, and helping to, the other thing I want to mention is that sometimes when we do that, you know, a lot of times communities um, maybe don't have access to each other. And so one of the things that I've found in my work also is that connecting of communities so that then they can support each other. Or how did you get that legislation passed? Or how did you get the solar job training program in coal country started? Um, and so it's also about information sharing. Um, so I love that role that we can play of amplifying the wonderful voices, supporting the groups doing the real work, and then also sharing so that um, others are learning and can do the great work. Um, so thank you again for having me. This has been a great discussion. Thank you, everyone. Thanks to all our panelists for your really uh, stimulating thoughts. Uh, it's been great spending the hour with you. And thanks to all our attendees for joining us and for asking great questions. Sorry we couldn't get to all of them. We tried to answer as many as we can and we'll, we'll continue to try and address them. Uh, we're gonna put a recording of this webinar on earthjournalism.net and on YouTube. So 
you can find a recording and share it with your colleagues. And I'd certainly encourage you to check out the reporting in the days and weeks and months ahead of, of Drew in 1-0 on Medium, of the Grist uh, online magazine, they do some wonderful work too, and of Shweta in India as well. These guys are really doing groundbreaking work and uh, we're very pleased you could join us. Thanks again everyone, and we hope to see you on our next EGN webinar. Thank you so much. Bye for now. Thanks, James. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.